My name is Maggie Long and I'm a lecturer in counselling in Ulster University. Um, today I'm going to speak to you about a piece of research that I carried out on um, exploring self-harm and help seeking from the perspectives of service users and practitioners who work with self-harm as well. Um, basically, um, the presentation, I'll give you a bit of an overview um, to contextualise the research. Um, I won't dwell too much on the background for self-harm as we've had a fairly uh, comprehensive uh, background from Denise and some of mine links in with that. Um, then I'll give you an overview, a run through of what the research entailed and provide you with an outline then of major findings in relation to help seeking um, and finish off with some conclusions and recommendations. Okay. <clears throat> so first of all, in terms of self-harm, and we know this already, it's been said a number of times today, um, self-harm is a major, it's a significant public health issue and it is regionally, internationally and so on. It is a major risk factor for suicide, and one study estimates that between 40 to 60% of people who die by suicide do have a history of self-harm, although not all people um, who self-harm will go on to take their own lives, and there is a complex relationship between those two things. Um, the reported incidence of self-harm far underestimate the prevalence, so like most things, um, we don't quite get beneath the surface in terms of our reported um, incidents. Um, the majority of people who self-harm do not present to formal statutory services. And that's something that's recognised in a range of different cultri countries. It's not just specific to the United Kingdom or Ireland. It's something to do with the nature of self-harm, that it is often a hidden and secretive behaviour, a shame-based behaviour that people have difficulty coming forward um, as one of those many things. Denise outlined the, uh, the iceberg. She gave you a picture. I don't have it. I just have words. Um, but basically, the tip of the iceberg is the, report, is, um, is the relatively rare incidence of suicide that we see. Um, just below the surface, we have the, mo the more common reported incidence of self-harm that can be uh, determined in the self-harm registries. Okay, so those people who do present to hospital departments. But the base, um, the base of the iceberg, so the broadest, is the most common of all. And that's what tends to be known as hidden self-harm. So those people who do not present to hospital emergency departments. And that's the group of people that it's most difficult to access. And research, um, it has been suggested that, that in order to access that base, um, the best type of research or the most suitable type of research are either school-based studies or community-based studies. Okay. Um, self-harm, most self-harm is hidden and it does occur in the community in non-clinical populations. Okay, we know this, so there are over 8,000 hospital emergency department presentations in Northern Ireland, just in terms of the, our context here, and we know that there's a higher incidence of, of intentional drug overdose in Northern Ireland and, uh, than there is in the Republic of Ireland. Um, the only school-based survey, so in terms of capturing that hidden population of self-harm, the only school-based studies that we have that have been carried out in Northern Ireland are the um, Northern Ireland Young Life and Time Survey, which was carried out in 2009 and 10, and the Northern Ireland Lifestyle and Coping Survey. Both of those were surveys that were carried out with 15 and 16 year olds here. Um, and both of them reported a 10% lifetime prevalence of self-harm among young people. So that means that about one in 10 of our young people here have tried self-harm on, on at least one occasion in their lives. Um, Research in the, on hidden self-harm in the community generally is, is hidden, um, but in terms of Northern Ireland, there are very few, if any, studies. Um, very few, okay? So that was where I sought to intervene, okay? That was where I wanted to base my, situate my research, to locate my research at that community level to try to understand the hidden element of self-harm. Um, reasons why it might be difficult to access, it, or why, it, why it, um, there is so little known about that is because generally that population is going to be difficult to access. How do we access people who aren't accessing services? How do we get them? Um, so the self-harm and help-seeking project, basically it was designed, um, it was, I, I sought to carry out a, a piece of qualitative research so I really wanted to understand in an in-depth way people's individual subjective experiences of help seeking. And in order to do that, um, I recruited 30 participants in total. So I had 10 service users. These were users of community services. So they were people 
who were availing of counselling services at the time of research participation. Some of them had attended emergency departments at in time and at a point in time, so I didn't, you know, it, it, it didn't end up actually getting the, the, the total hidden population, but many of them had never attended A and E as well. Um, I also recruited 20 practitioners who worked with self-harm on an ongoing basis. And those practitioners um, included counsellors, community workers, youth workers. Um, I had members of the clergy. So a whole range, people who worked in crisis response, a whole range of practitioners. Um, but it seemed that people who worked at a community level might have a sort of broader range of experience in working with self-harm than those who worked in the hospitals who were only seeing these particular reported presentations because many people might attend community services and never go near statutory services. So that was, that was the thinking behind that. Um, so one-to-one -one interviews were carried out, in-depth one-to-one interviews were carried out. Some lasted half an hour, some an hour and a half, a range of those. They were all transcribed and analysed and, and the findings um, written up from that. Okay. So in terms of the research finding itself for the purposes of this presentation, I'll give you an overview of some of the barriers, major barriers that were identified to help seeking um, and then experiences of help seeking. Okay. So in terms of barriers to help seeking, these are data extracts, these are quotes from the participants in the study and I've indicated whether they are practitioners or service users. The top one is from a service user. So the major barrier to help seeking is stigma. Self-harm is a very stigmatised behaviour as we know. Um, it's something that there's not a lot of understanding about and that was the issue that was raised by the service user. People don't understand what self-harm is. They just think it's either a cry for help or just some kind of psychiatric disorder. They don't see it as a manifestation, I suppose, of other things that are going on. I really think there is an ignorance around it and that would stop people going for help. Okay, so it's acknowledged that that social stigma, the level of judgment, negative attitudes and so on that's out there in wider society impacts and prevents people from going forward. The second quote there, you can have a look there for yourselves. Um, but basically that's from one of the gatekeepers. That was a youth worker talking about young people who they had worked with who had experiences going for help and it had been a negative experience and that had delayed them from going forward then again and seeking help again at a subsequent point in the future. <clears throat> okay. So in terms of we have the social stigma, which is the stigma that's out there in society, um, but the people who self-harm aren't immune to that. Okay. So social stigma can lead to what's known as self-stigma or internal stigma, where basically people internalise those negative judgments from other people and believe it to be legitimate and start to feel a sense of confusion then, doubt their own motivations, doubt how they're feeling, those sorts of things. And that in turn is a real stumbling block, but an internal stumbling block to see people seeking help. So this service user talked about it, feeling like you're the only person in the world who self-harms. They're sort of like a spiral. Um, where you know you're not attention seeking because you go to great lengths to hide it but at the same time you're thinking am I attention seeking by doing this and hoping someone will see it so you know it's confusing you have a lot of arguments with yourself okay so attention seeking is something that you can hear a derogatory comment that people hear time and time again in, in relation to self-harm and it's to say that 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 kind of negative attitude isn't helpful in terms of people moving forward and, and it causes people then to doubt themselves because they're hiding this behaviour for many years, but then thinking, oh, maybe, you know, doubting, doubting themselves and how that impacts on their capacity to seek help. Okay, um, other barriers to help seeking internal barriers, the functions of self-harm itself, so the actual purpose that the self-harm serves for the person. So when somebody actually engages in self-harm for the first time and they find relief from it, or it helps them to cope with something, or it helps them to feel a sense of control whenever life feels out of control. Because generally people who self-harm, um, and certainly for the participants of my study, nobody did it just because. People did it because they were dealing with very difficult and debilitating life circumstances. Okay, And the fact that the self-harm helped them to cope with those, those difficult life circumstances acted as a barrier to help seeking in and of itself. Because, <coughs> because the self-harm actually helped. Okay. So this is one service user put it quite well, um, which you can read again for yourselves. But the key lines there, I really resented attempts to get me to stop cutting because I felt like they were taking away the one thing that was a release, an outlet for me, and I had no other way. Okay, and this particular service user began to self-harm 
living in a context of abuse in their family home. So it was a difficult, a very difficult um, home environment that they, were, that they were responding to. And there was no other support in place for that person at that time. Okay. <clears throat> um, also, just to, to link in with that, that, it, that for many it was about coping. Um, and so um, to, to be aware or that the, 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 the participants were afraid that their intentions would be misunderstood. So that if they told somebody that they were self-harming and then there was the assumption that perhaps that, was, that meant that they were suicidal and the repercussions, the potential repercussions of that then for them was another impediment to seeking help. <clears throat> um, some of the practitioners talked about this, the role of, of self-harm as a means of communicating emotional distress whereby people sort of communicate their emotional pain through their body when, when verbal communication isn't enough for whatever reason sometimes that's through trauma and that can impede a person's capacity to speak so if somebody is unable to communicate their emotions verbally then how can they seek help um, when that requires them to verbally articulate their distress and what they're going through so that function of self-harm as a, as a method of communication acted as a barrier as well <clears throat> In terms of experiences of help seeking, um, generally, so as I'd said and, and as Denise highlighted, very often self-harm is about a coping mechanism. It's not necessarily about suicide. But um, some of the participants in my study indicated that with, if there was sort of an increase in the intensity of the self-harm behaviour over time and the issues that led to the self-harm weren't resolved, and there was no support in place, it could lead to a suicidal crisis or suicidal ideation. Okay. Um, so for a number of the participants in, in my study, it took a suicidal crisis to come about for the person to seek help for the first time. Um, here's one example. I'm still not sure in my head whether it was a suicide attempt or whether it was self-harm. I went out to the kitchen and slipped my wrist and was taken to hospital because at that point I did want to die. I wasn't thinking about anything else and I couldn't even feel myself. I couldn't even, it wasn't sore. So for that particular participant, that was the first point at which anyone else became aware that they had been engaging in self-harm for a number of years, over 10 years at that point. So it is the crisis point where the person becomes visible, reaches that upper bit of the, upper bit of the uh, iceberg, shall we say. Um, participants described a loss of control, so while at the beginning self-harm might have provided a sense of control for them in, in situations where they felt like they were out of control, in time the self-harm seemed to take on a life of its own, and so they started to feel like they were controlled by the self-harm. Okay, um, And that was something that spiralled them towards this crisis point. You know, So once it stopped being something I could control, I didn't want it, so I wanted someone to get the control back, and I knew then that I needed help. One example. <clears throat> okay. Um, at something that came up a number of times from a number of different participants in the study was this sense of feeling dehumanised in the treatment services. People talked about wanting to be treated like a person, um, talked about not feeling like a person. It gave me the impression, just highlight the bottom quote there, it gave me the impression of being a case, not a person, but a case. Okay. Um, so this was something that came up time and time again and acted as a deterrent for subsequent help seeking. Um, you know, if somebody had obviously attended a situation and had been made, uh, been made to feel less than human in a certain situation, it made them reluctant to seek help again. Okay. <coughs> um, and also in terms of just the, 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 the quote at the top as well, you know, this participant said they had been to a a few times they said, you, know, you, get let, you get let out into the nowhere, um, and that's how suicide can become a very big thing for people. So reflecting on that for others. Um, okay. Another important aspect of the study, and this related more particularly to young people, and practitioners reflected on this who worked with young people, as well as a number, uh, two of the participants who reflected on their own experiences in their teenage years, where the lack of autonomy and help seeking was taken, the autonomy was taken away from them. So um, their self-harm was discovered and it was then reported onwards, basically. Um, and that wasn't found to be or seen to be um, in any way helpful to them. 
So for two of the participants who reflected on that type of experience in their teenage years, that didn't actually, um, when the self-harm was reported on to their parents and, and so on by the school, it didn't actually stop their health self-harm behaviour. What it did was increase the risk. Um, it made the self-harm more hidden and increased the levels of risk. So there's something in there in terms of working with young people and ensuring the appropriate reporting on and uh, not totally depleting a young person's autonomy in terms of what they hope to gain out of, um, out of their help-seeking experiences. Um, some positive help-seeking experiences, and there were, there were positive, certainly positive help-seeking experiences, both in statutory services and in community services. Um, the top quote is from a service user who did end up being admitted to psychiatric hospital following an emergency department pre um, presentation and found it a, a, really, a really wonderful experience um, and was able then to be the catalyst for that person moving on with their life. Um, another participant talked about, and this was an experience with a counselling service, where they talked about feeling more how it was, they, um, when they talked about their self-harm, it was normalised. Um, and that was very helpful to them, you know, that it was, they weren't made to feel like there was something wrong with them. Okay, so the counsellor wasn't shocked by it. I think that helped because I wasn't talking about it to glorify it. I was, it was a part of me, so for them to normalise it too was a great help. Um, another experience with a GP, a person who attended their GP initially and was, were afraid to go for counselling or any further support. So the GP saw them on a weekly basis until such time as they felt like they could go on to, to speak to another professional. Um, Okay, uh, um, a, a significant issue that came up in terms of psychiatric services was to do with the stigma surrounding that. So what sort of prevents people when they go to emergency departments, why do they not avail of the follow-up care? And this was something that was identified um, quite powerfully by one of the participants, you know, talking about the word psychiatric conjures up all sorts of negative connotations. And if I go to that, um, as they put it, if I blot my copybook with this mental illness, I'll never be for anything. I'll never achieve my goal. So they never went back. Okay. Um, so is there a potential for follow-up care that isn't situated within psychiatric services? Where that, or we can push to reduce the label of, of, psych, of psychiatric care. Um, acknowledging that finding the courage to seek help, that it is a difficult process, that when people do seek help, um, generally they have been self-harming for a long time, it has been hidden, no one else has been aware of it, so when somebody does actually build up the courage to do that, services need to be appropriately sensitive and responsive to their needs. Um, you know, and this was somebody who worked in a crisis response centre saying that frequently you see people walking up and down the street time and time again, or driving up and down the street, building up the courage to come through the door for the first time. So the people working at every level, from a receptionist to the actual practitioners who are working on an ongoing basis, are, can be sensitive um, uh, in their responses to a person walking in off the street feeling in that way. Um, just want to identify in terms of those people who did seek help, who did find, did have some negative experiences, but overall managed to, manage to find a positive health seeking experience. Um, and demonstrated a great deal of resilience along the way and were able to overcome self-harm. So there is the potential for this to happen, you know, and, and some of these um, extracts are quite powerful, I think, you know. Um, the bottom one there from a service user, I can recognise myself as a normal human being who went through a terrible time. I can recognise myself as a human being who was needing help but didn't know how to go about it. So I don't hate myself for it anymore. I know my reasons as to why I did it. I can think clearly about it and I can understand it. And I can look at my scar and say that I'm proud that I got through it, that I survived and that I'm still surviving in every single day that I go along. So there is the potential. With the appropriate support, there is the potential for people to move beyond if that's what they want to do. <clears throat> and what helped most of all in terms of services and and the type of support that people get in services, being treated like a person, you know, somebody seeming like they cared. If somebody wants to help the person, it makes them feel like they're worthy of help. That can be very helpful, you know. And the bottom quote there, compassion and treating the person like they're a person, because it's not like you can ever go wrong with that. 
I've never heard anyone say you're treating her too much like a person. Um, so, maybe simple, it's not always easy. Um, so in terms of conclusions and recommendations, there is a need to develop understanding um, of self-harm in Northern Ireland and of the services that we provide to, to improve service provision as well. Um, there is a real gap in the research, so any more research that can be carried out at a community level can clearly enhance and advance the field and understanding in the field. Um, there's a need for dedicated self-harm awareness training, and this has been ruled out in the Republic of Ireland in, sta in the health service, um, but for people working in, path in, um, in community level services as well. You know that for, for everybody, um, so for people working in, in front line in a range of roles, um, and also then emotional support for practitioners who are working with self harm on, a, on an ongoing basis. And again, those two the self harm awareness training and the emotional support for practitioners were recommended in a systematic review um, as improving patient care as well as clinical confidence among practitioners, too. So some, some practitioners working in certain roles do have therapeutic supervision, counsellors would, for instance, but not everybody. You know, a nurse can avail of supervision, but can, she, can they avail of therapeutic supervision to actually unpack the different difficult issues that working with self-harm arises with them? Because ultimately that's in the best interest of patient care. Um, potentially the role for pastoral care, emotional support within emergency departments, um, that can go alongside the provision of medical care so that people don't walk out, so that people don't feel overwhelmed, um, and the potential for follow-up care outside of, st of statutory services, so outside of psychiatric services, a community level um, support for people in terms of the follow-up care. And again, that's something that's being piloted in Scotland. It's the distress brief inter intervention um, as part of the mental health strategy in Scotland. Um, and it is being led by the, by the community sector over there. Um, and I suppose, um, finally, it would be very helpful if we could gather some quantitative data to get an understanding of actually the, the prevalence, how much hidden self-harm is there in Northern Ireland, and some sort of creative means of doing that so we can really have an accurate... In the Republic of Ireland, they're able to estimate that there are 60,000 cases of hidden self-harm per year, we don't have a similar mechanism here, so is there a way that we can do that and perhaps drill down into some of that data so we can get um, a better understanding of what's actually happening rather than a little bit of guesswork. Um, and that's me, I'm finished, thank you very much.